This is a season when we love to sing Christmas carols, and I want to begin with a stanza of a carol that may not be uh, familiar to many, the, the carol, All My Heart This Night Rejoices. Uh, the songwriter Paul Gerhardt uses his poetic license to imagine the Christ child speaking from the manger. Hark! A voice from yonder manger, soft and sweet, doth entreat. I love the premise that even from his first breath, breath, Jesus, born in Bethlehem, had something to say to the world. And so what was his message in the carol? It goes like this. Flee from woe and danger, brethren, from all ills that grieve you. You are freed. All you need I will surely give you. It's a message of safety and comfort and freedom and provision, really all of the things that we've prayed for for our graduates. And it's all true, I think, to the overall teaching of Scripture, but I think we can actually be more specific. Have you ever noticed what the Bible explicitly says that Christ proclaimed from the manger where he was born? I refer to Hebrews chapter 10, which declares that when Christ came into the world, he said, now, what do you suppose it was that Christ said when he came into the world? What's the message from the manger? Actually, it comes from Psalm 40, our last Friday morning psalm of the semester. And according to Hebrews, when Jesus came into the world, he said this, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. That's Hebrews 10, quoting Psalm 40, and it has within it, I think, not just the true meaning of Christmas, but the true meaning of everything. Now, Psalm 40 became a lot more famous in the 1980s as the final track on U2's War album. But long before that psalm ever made it to Dublin, it was famous in Jerusalem. It was one of the songs that people sang as a song of David. It's a song of waiting on God and celebrating his salvation and also crying out to God when your situation seems totally desperate. I think it's interesting to compare the first and the last verses of Psalm 40. It opens, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. Obviously, David had, had prayed and been delivered, but by the time you get to the end of the psalm, he's back in trouble and he's praying again, Lord, I'm poor and needy. Do not delay, oh my God, he's, he's waiting again. And maybe, maybe you're like David, you, you have a problem, you pray about it, eventually God helps you, but almost before you know it, you have another problem, you need as much prayer as ever. And if that's the kind of life you have, in trouble and then in trouble again, Psalm 40 is a great song for you to learn how to sing. It opens with David praising God for, for past deliverance, maybe the kinds of experiences he prayed about in Psalm 38 and Psalm 39. There were enemies coming against him. They, there were past mistakes that were haunting him. His, his strength was failing. He felt all alone. All of these things are things that he testifies to. His heart in so much pain at some points he can hardly speak. But David never gave up the hope that God would save him. He kept praying and kept waiting. And eventually God came and saved him. And he, he wanted to praise God with these famous words from the beginning of Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. He, he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. First verse, most translations say something like, I waited patiently, and that's, that's fair enough. But in Hebrew, the, the word is simply repeated. I waited waited. 
even the, the way it's repeated, gives you this sense of salvation that was a long time coming. And that's the way it was for David. It's, it's often true for us. We have to wait a long time for God to answer. I love the way David describes his deliverance when it finally came. God pulled him up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. Reminds me of the Slough of Despond in Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Do you know the story? A Christian had fled from the city of destruction and very quickly when he left the city, he got stuck in this symbol of spiritual discouragement, the, the slough of despond or slew of despond if you prefer. Fortunately, this character help was there and he gave him a hand. Uh, Bunyan obviously had Psalm 40 in mind when he wrote this because he said that help gave Christian his hand and drew him out and set him upon sound ground. As far as we know, David never got pulled out of a literal pit. Joseph did, you probably remember that story, Jeremiah did, but, but not David. I think he's speaking here metaphorically, and I, I find it helpful, frankly, that the pit is unspecified because it makes it easier to apply it to my own experience. There are lots of dark pits in life. Lots of miry bogs. And sooner or later, this is true for our students, it's true for our graduates, you're going to find yourself where David was, a pit of defeat and spiritual despair, a pit of grief and fear, perhaps, or a pit of anxiety, maybe addiction. And when you find yourself down there, the thing to do is admit that you are totally helpless and ask God to save you. And David would say what the scripture says, God will pull you out. If you're, if you're really in need, you should pray. And if you really trust in God, he will deliver you. I love the way David describes this. He said that, he said that God inclined to him. You can imagine Almighty God leaning over the edge of the pit, maybe cupping his ear to hear David's prayer. God listened to David. He pulled him out, out of the mud. He put him onto a solid rock and put a song into David's mouth, a song of salvation, like the song we'll be singing at the end of chapel this morning, the Hallelujah Chorus. When God saves you and delivers you, you want to sing about it out loud so that other people can, can hear you and maybe trust in God the same way that you do. That was the hope that David had, even in writing this song. Now, as David continues to sing in verses 4 through 10, he reflects on the goodness of God. He, he wants us to know this, this relationship you have with God, it's not just getting rescued at some particular moment of danger, it's having an ongoing relationship with him. In verse 5, he refers to God's thoughts toward us. It's really David wanting us to know that God is thinking about us all the time. He, he notices what is happening to us, and more than that, he cares about it. And David really needed that because the situation he goes on to describe through the rest of the psalm is, is pretty desperate. There, there are evils around him. Maybe he wasn't down in the absolute pit anymore, but there were still plenty of dangers. His sins were as numerous as the hairs on his head. People were trying to take his life. When he, when he stumbled, when he was in trouble, there were people gloating over him. But in all of that, David never lost his faith in the goodness of God. He says in verse 11, your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. It's a good verse for all of us as we look to the future, a verse of confidence in the love and the faithfulness of God. And that, that confidence that David had wasn't based on his outward experience, uh, circumstances. It was based on the character of God himself and on the promises that God had made. Please understand this morning that because you are a child of God, you have a heavenly father who is always looking on you and on your situation with loving concern. Simply put, you are in God's thoughts. 
then if you are tempted to doubt that he knows what is going on or that he even cares, believe the testimony of Psalm 40. As David comes to the last verse, he says, As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. He goes on to say, You are my help and my deliverer. Now, all of this is the context for the stunning surrender that David makes in the middle of this psalm in verses 6 through 8. He had experienced God's saving work. The more he experienced of that, the more of his life that he wanted to, to give over to God. He, he understood that God wanted something more out of him than simply showing up for worship every now and then, just going through the motions. No, he says, in sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted. It's David's way of saying that empty religious ritual is not pleasing to God. So what is pleasing to God? Not sacrifice, but obedience. It's not just, just part of us that God wants, it's all of us. He demands complete obedience to his word, total surrender to his will. And so David stood before God and he, he says in this psalm, Behold, I have come, I delight to do your will, O my God. Now it's an interesting way of talking. Behold, I have come. I mean, who even speaks this way? Uh, try it when you get home to your apartment sometime and see how people react. Behold, I have come. <laughs> it's the kind of thing really only royalty should say. That's why David says it here. He's the chosen king. He is offering himself, maybe even in a representative way, to God. And he is announcing his intention that he will do everything that is written about him in the word of God. And he uses a very striking image for this. It's an important image. It's also kind of difficult, at least in terms of interpretation. In verse 6, he tells us that God gave him an open ear or that God opened his ears. Maybe it simply means that David was ready to hear whatever God wanted to say. Some commentators think, though, that he is referring to the ancient ritual described in Exodus 21, whereby a freed slave would choose to make a lifelong commitment to a former master. The slave had served six years of servitude. He was free to go, but, but if he really loved his master, he might volunteer to remain in service. And according to custom, his ear would be pierced against the doorpost of his master's house. From that point forward, he would belong to his master. Now, as far as we know, slaves only had one ear pierced, but Psalm 40 uses the plural ears. So maybe that's over-interpreting the psalm, but I, I'm not sure how much difference it makes because whether David's ear was pierced or whether his ears were open, either way, the point is that he listens to his divine master and obeys his mighty word. And according to Hebrews, this is what Jesus was saying from the manger. See the little baby lying there. You are seeing the Son of God utterly surrendered to his Father's will. There's something that he's, he's, in effect, saying from the manger. He's saying that he is ready to obey every law that God had ever commanded. He would live in perfect love. He's saying that he was ready to do everything prophesied about him, everything that was written in this scroll, the prophecies of the Messiah. He, he read David's scroll. He could see himself in it. And he is saying that he will do whatever the Father calls him to do, up to and including the cross where he died for our sins. Now, in order to do all of that, the Son of God needed to enter into our humanity. He couldn't live a life of perfect obedience or suffer a death that made complete atonement unless he had a body to do it in. And so, what an amazing detail. When Hebrews quotes David's psalm, it doesn't say, you have given me an open ear. It says, a body you have prepared for me. Now here the New Testament is taking prophetic license, as it often does, to help us understand the full meaning of the Old Testament. And just think about it, when a servant stood against a doorpost, he wasn't just offering his master his earlobe. He was really surrendering his entire self for a lifetime of service. 
And the writer to the Hebrews understood all of that. He took David's ear and he turned it into the Messiah's body so that we would understand the baby in the manger came to give his physical body for the life of the world. This is the, the coming of the Christ at the first Christmas, the immortal God becoming a mortal man. It's the mystery of the incarnation. And he did it in a body. That's what the incarnation means. A body that from the beginning was vulnerable to all of the sufferings of a fallen world, even unto death. This is what we hear Christ say at Christmas, the message from the manger. If you listen carefully, you can hear what the infant savior is saying. I will suffer for the kingdom of God. I will offer my body to torture. I will surrender my soul to the anguish of death and give my life blood to save my people from their sins. As it says in the old spiritual, quoting Jesus himself, prepare me one body, I'll go down, I'll go down. Prepare me one body like man, I'll go down and die. And now God is calling us to make a similar surrender, offering our bodies to God in the service of his kingdom. This week I, I learned of the death of Helen Rosevere, missionary to the Congo, sometimes speaker here on the, in, in chapel at Wheaton College. She was 91 and for many years she had exercised a faithful ministry of medicine to the people of Congo, a ministry that during a time of civil war included house arrest, physical beatings, and it is sad to say brutal rape. In a strange way, this is the way Dr. Rosevere described it, these sufferings were the answer to her prayers because when she first committed her life to Christ, she, she stood up in a church service and said, I'll go anywhere God wants me to, whatever the cost. After that, she had a few second thoughts about it. She went up into the mountains to have a serious talk with her Savior, and here is how she prayed. I wonder, would you have the boldness to pray like this? Okay, God, today I meant it. Go ahead and make me more like Jesus, whatever the cost, but please, when I feel I can't stand it anymore and I cry out, stop, will you ignore my stop? And remember that today I said, Go ahead. It was Helen Rosevere's way of taking the body that God had prepared for her and saying, Behold, I have come to do your will, O oh God. Do you think it was worth it? At one point when Dr. Rosevere was terrified and tormented, she felt so alone. She believed God had failed her. But then she sensed his presence and him saying to her, you asked me when you were first converted for this privilege. This is it. These are, are not your sufferings. They're mine. And all I ask of you is the loan of your body. She was prepared for the service of God, which eventually she came to see as her highest privilege. She was suffering with Christ and for Christ. I have tried to count the cost, she later wrote, but I find it all swallowed up in the privilege. Brothers and sisters, this is our privilege as well, to offer ourselves to the Savior who gave his body for our salvation.